Hello, uh, welcome to this, the seventh of my videos introducing the basic ideas of uh, Marx and Marxism. Uh, and this is the second one devoted to the question of Marx's theory of history or historical materialism. In the first on historical materialism, I explained the basics of the theory, um, that it begins with the labour of the mass of ordinary people on nature and how that is organised. That uh, it leads to a, a, a conception of there being an economic base to society and a political ideological superstructure and an argument that society develops through uh, the expansion of its productive forces which also come into then come into conflict with uh, the social relations of production uh, and that lead, it leads on to social revolution through a process of class struggle. Now uh, historical materialism has been a guide to action, a guide to analysis and action uh, for the Marxist movement for the last 150 years and it's also been uh, the basis for uh, a whole number of outstanding works of actual history. Um, Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution, James Connolly's Labour in Irish History, C.L.R. James, The Black Jacobins, The Study of the uh, Slave Revolt in Haiti, uh, E.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class, and many other classic, uh, classic historical studies. Um, but throughout this time, the main criticism of uh, historical materialism as an explanation of history, especially in academic circles, is that it overestimates the role of the economy. Uh, indeed, it's often presented as a theory of uh, mechanical economic determinism, that economics explains everything that goes on in history and in society. Um, indeed, it has to be recognised that sometimes would-be Marxists have interpreted the theory this way and espoused some form or other of uh, economic determinism. But in fact, this is a substantial misinterpretation it's a major mistake. And uh, interestingly, Engels, at the end of his life, um, wrote a whole series of letters in which he pointed out that there, uh, this was not what he and uh, Marx ever intended. Um, he explained that they had to emphasise the economic factor uh, because it was neglected by everybody else or ignored uh, by all, by all, in all the previous uh, sort of explanations of history. Uh, but that they were not saying more than that that was the foundation, that was the basis from which you've departed, and they were not at all denying the uh, role of uh, uh, politics or ideas or organisation or even religion and so on, and that all these developed a certain autonomy and reflected back on and influenced the real course of development. Engels, for example, uh, uh, he made these points again and again, but I'll quote them so you... Hear, hear what he said. He said, the economic situation is the basis, but the various elements of the superstructure, political forms of the class struggle and its results, to wit constitutions established by the victorious class after a successful battle, juridical forms, and even the reflexes of all these actual struggles in the brains of the participants, political, juristic, philosophical theories, religious views, and their further development in the systems of dogmas also exercise their influence on the course of the historical struggles. There is an interaction of all these elements in which, amid all the endless host of accidents, um, the economic movement finally asserts itself as necessary. So it's a very complicated, dialectical, as Engel says, uh, um, uh, process. And we must remember here that Marxism is a theory of class struggle and revolution. Uh, and uh, let's take the example of the transition from feudalism to capitalism, from the feudal mode of production that prevailed in the Middle Ages to modern capitalism. The foundation of this transition was that capitalism as a way of producing develops within feudalism and the whole process would not have been possible if it were not for the fact that capitalism was a 
more productive economic system than feudalism, that it yielded a higher productivity of, uh, of labour, and that made it possible for it to supplant uh, feudalism. But the actual process itself was not at all a gradual, uh, econo purely economic one. Uh, not, n not at all something that happened smoothly or evenly. On the contrary, it was several hundred years of wars and revolutions. You can go back to uh, the Reformation uh, with Martin Luther that I spoke about la uh, uh, in the last session, uh, the Counter-Reformation, reaction by uh, the feudal aristocracy and the church to try and prevent uh, the, the changes of the Reformation. You can see the Dutch Revolt uh, in the 16th and uh, uh, beginning of the 17th century, the uh, English Civil War, English Revolution uh, uh, of 1642, the American Revolution, finally the French Revolution of 1789, and so on. And in these uh, uh, struggles and wars, there were also many you know, so-called religious wars, but were really part of this process. But in uh, these revolutions and wars, that ideas, political organisation, and even individual leaders all played an important role. Um, uh, for example, the uh, in the Reformation, you have to see the role played by Martin Luther and perhaps even more importantly by John Calvin and the role of Protestantism in encouraging uh, the development of capitalism. Uh, in uh, the 18th century you can see the tremendously important role of the philosophes, the French philosophes of the Enlightenment, Diderot, Voltaire, Rousseau and so on, in preparing the way for the French Revolution and in influencing the people who carried the French Revolution out. Uh, you see again in the, uh, the role of organisation, you can see the new model army created by Cromwell and its role in defeating Charles I in the English Revolution. Uh, you can see the role of the Jacobins in the French Revolution. And as I said, even individual leaders like the personality of Cromwell and his determination made a difference, as did, if you it's often called the fanaticism, but the uh, revolutionary enthusiasm of someone like uh, Robespierre. So the whole process was not at all automatic, and at various points it could have been halted or turned back. Indeed, there were many setbacks in the, in the, in the process of transition from feudalism to capitalism. So it was not smooth, it was not inevitable, it was not simple. And, and the same thing applies to uh, the question of the socialist revolution as well. When we look at the uh, Russian Revolution, the one real example we have of a socialist revolution so far, uh, what, what do we find? We find that it had profound roots in the development of Russian society, profound economic and social roots in the way in which capitalism was developing within the outdated, increasingly outdated framework of uh, the Tsari, uh, of Tsarism how Tsarism was going into decay, how uh, both the bourgeoisie were developing, but even more strongly, the Russian working class was, de uh, uh, was developing, and how the crisis of Russian society br were, uh, came to the fore with in the uh, First World War, uh, and the working class moved onto the stage, overthrowing the Tsar, more or less spontaneously, and so on. So we can see all of this uh, had profound economic and social roots. But it's also true that the fact that there existed a powerful socialist organisation, revolutionary socialist organisation, the Bolsheviks, made an immense difference in the fact that that revolution turned into the October Revolution, the socialist revolution, the working class was able to take power. And even within that, we can say, and Trotsky in his great history of the Russian Revolution that I mentioned points this out, within that, Lenin himself made several decisive interventions, including persuading the leadership of the Bolshevik Party to launch the insurrection in October, uh, in October 1917. So Lenin was only the last link in a long chain that goes back into the class struggle and, its, and into Russian history, but that last link was extremely important. And so that gives you an idea of the fact that um, it's a 
mechanical distortion of Marxism to think uh, of it as a simple theory of economic determinism uh, in which the productive forces determine everything and shape everything else, not at all. But having said that, and that's extremely important because that, you know, revolutionary activity, political activity in general would be a waste of time. Having, ha having said that, also have to say that uh, you can go too far with this, this idea of the autonomy and, the, uh, and uh, of political forces and so on, to a point where you get back to where the old bourgeois theories of history in which it's all about individuals and ideas and so on and we lose sight of the economic foundations. And I think that uh, the, the fact that in the end the course of history is shaped by the masses and that bef even before that we have the question of the relationship between human beings and nature and human labour and nature as the foundation for the whole process, uh, that the uh, fact of climate change, the awesome fact of climate change, uh, is something that uh, will serve to remind us uh, 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 of that. But again, to say overcoming the crisis of climate change will involve struggle, it will involve organisation, and it will involve revolutionary uh, leadership. So that is, again, even in, in its more complicated and developed form, historical materialism leads us back to the question of revolution.